Either you went there, your kids went there, I see a few hands around. Uh, in an earlier time, the school that I'm dean of would have been known as the School of Religion and Philosophy. Uh, and a couple years ago, shortly after I became dean, we changed the name of our particular school from School of Religion and Philosophy to School of Christian Studies. Back in the, way back in the day, School of Religion and Philosophy would have meant something a bit different than it means today, and we wanted to be crystal clear about what we are preparing students to, to do within the school that I'm in charge of at Wayland Baptist University, and we are thoroughly committed as a Texas Baptist University to prepare the next generation of leaders to serve Christ, to serve Christ's church, and to serve the communities where God places them. In the School of Christian Studies, we do that by preparing the next generation of ministry leaders. Whether it be to serve in churches like First Baptist Hereford, or to serve overseas in mission appointments, uh, to serve in a variety of capacities, that's what we do, and we are thoroughly committed to it. And then across our university, we are thoroughly committed to preparing the next generation of Christian leaders in whatever occupation God places them in. As I talk with prospective students, one of the things I'll often ask a student is, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, if y'all had that question asked, or, you know, you probably had that question asked when you were younger, you may be, still be trying to figure out the answer to that question. Uh, I know at times I wonder if I'm really grown up yet, and then I look in the mirror and see the gray hair, and hair that's turning gray, and the hair that's turned loose, and realize I, I do qualify as a grown-up now. And oftentimes, prospective students will say, well, I want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. or You can go down the list of professions. And I say, no, what, what do you want to be? What's God calling you to be and to do? And it goes beyond just, I want to be, you know, and if they say doctor, they'll say, oh, I want to be an OBGYN or an internal medicine or general practitioner say, well, that's fine, but what kind of fill-in-the-blank do you want to be? And trying to help students understand that what we are about at Wayland and what they are, should be about as a Christ follower is not only preparing for the occupational calling that God has placed before them, but also to prepare for the vocational calling that God calls all of us to as Christ followers, and that's to make Christ known. And so whether, whatever the occupational blank is for our students, we want them to lean into that occupational calling with the understanding that God gifts each of us with talents and abilities to serve where God places us so that we can accomplish the primary task that each of us has as Christ followers, and that's to make Christ known. And so thank you all as a church for your support of Wayland Baptist University for your prayers for your financial support through Texas Baptist, for giving that many of y'all do to the university directly. We greatly appreciate your prayers and your support. It makes possible the task that we've been placed with of preparing the next generation of Christian leaders, and we are very, very grateful for you and for your support of the university. As we get started this morning with the sermon time, I feel like I could give the invitation at this point between the announcement that was made and the evidence of service in the church with 30 plus people showing up to help someone move that probably many of those 30 had never met before, to the prayer that was offered right before the offering, to the music that we sang and the special music that we heard, especially the last chorus that we sang, it as well. That chorus, as many of y'all probably realize, based on the iconic hymn that Horatio Spafford wrote in 1871. Many of y'all know the story of Horatio Spafford and it as well with my soul. Hadn't planned to talk about this this morning, but just so y'all know, my academic discipline is church history. 
Uh, and so, you know, I, prior to coming to Wayland, uh, now five years ago, this is my sixth year at Wayland, I came to be the new old guy at Wayland. All of their, per, you know, professors that had been there for 20 plus years were retiring. We had an excellent uh, group of young faculty, and then the school decided they needed somebody to be the new old guy on the faculty. And, you know, I'm 30 plus years into teaching, I was on faculty at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, helped start a new seminary called B.H. Carroll Theological Institute, spent eight years uh, in teaching in the graduate programs for Dallas Baptist University, and then came out to West Texas to be the new old guy. I'm a church history nerd, and so when you have a song like It Is Well, you know, it's hard to let that go. Uh, you know, 1871, when Horatio Spafford writes that hymn, Horatio Spafford, as y'all might know, Chicago businessman, extremely successful lawyer and businessman. His family, five kids, they'd had a, a tragedy, uh, or actually 1871 was when the tragedy occurred, 1873 was when the second tragedy occurred that led to the writing of the hymn. 1871, Horatio and his wife Anna, one of their young children, died of pneumonia. And you can imagine what that does to a family. And some of y'all may have experienced that. And in the midst of recovering from the grief that comes with the loss of a child, the family decided they needed time in Europe. November of 1873 rolls around. Horatio, lawyer, businessman, extremely busy with all that was going on in his life in Chicago decides the family's going to go, and Anna and their four remaining kids sail off from the U.S. to Europe on the Ville de Harve. November 21, Ville de Harve strikes a Scottish ship on its ocean passage, four days into the ocean passage. 313 souls on board, about 225, 226 perish when that ship sinks very quickly to the depths. Another ship coming by finds Anna floating on some debris, rescues her, the four children gone. Telegram goes off to Horatio, who is supposed to be following on a boat a few weeks later. He was wrapping up some business in Chicago, was going to join the family. Gets the telegram, a portion of the telegram reads simply, saved alone. The next phrase was, what do I do? Horatio makes his way over. When he gets, the, he asks, as the story goes, he asked the captain of the ship that he was sailing on to awake him when they got to the spot where that fatal event occurred just a bit earlier. And, it, and as the story goes, while standing there, the words to it is well with my soul came to Spafford, put pen to paper, and we have that hymn that then became the inspiration for the chorus that was sung this morning. How is it that a Horatio Spafford, a lawyer and businessman in Chicago, and I think a part of the reason the story resonates with me so much is not only am I not from Plainview, I'm not from Texas. I probably shouldn't admit that uh, up front. I grew up outside of Chicago, and so that story always kind of captivated me as a kid growing up just outside of Chicago, knowing uh, the connections um, I'm an autograph collector. It's the history nerd in me. Uh, in my library, I have a book that was owned by Horatio Spafford. has his signature in the cover of it. And I'll occasionally pull it off the shelf just to look at the signature and remind myself that it's well. Um, how is it that he's able to write those words in the midst of such tragedy? Well, while I hadn't... I planned on us singing that song this morning. I didn't ask what songs were going to be sung this morning. It ties in with where I want to go with the sermon this morning. You know, at Wayland Baptist University, and if we have the PowerPoint, um, we can go ahead and throw that thing up. And the second slide, well, we can leave that one up for a bit, uh, or we can go this, anyway, <laughs> either one. <laughs> Thank you, Dayton. Dayton's doing a great job up there, and I'm going to work on Dayton to try to get him to Wayland. Uh, so fair warning, Dayton, not Dayton, I'm coming for you. Um, it's part of my job as a dean. Um, hope. That hope that Horatio Spafford had when he penned those words. The hope 
of a new day dawning. The hope of being relieved from fear that can grip us, whether it's from a pandemic that has raged and run multiple courses and now seems to be resurging again, from wars that are beyond our control and yet we're frustrated by what's happening in the world beyond us, from natural disasters occur that we're not expecting, we have a hurricane, tropical storm bearing down on the northeast coast of the United States right now, millions of people in its path who are worried about what's going to come next. And in the midst of news coverage on that hurricane, massive catastrophic flooding yesterday in west central Tennessee that probably most people don't even realize occurred because of everything that else is, that is going on. My brother and sister-in-law happened to live in the town, Waverly, Tennessee, that was impacted by that. As of midnight last night, 10 people dead, another 31 missing. The high school where my brother is principal, significantly damaged. I saw pictures late last night of my brother walking through the school still with water inside the building as the flash flood was still receding in the area. Hope. What is it that gives us that hope? What I want to talk about this morning is the hope that we have with the light that is Jesus Christ. We talk about it at Wayland Baptist University. Go to the next slide there. And just mention it briefly. When you look at our seal at Wayland Baptist University, two, pa two, words, two uh, passages from Scripture play out on that seal. Across the, bottom, across the bottom of it, let there be light. That passage uh, from the very opening of the Old Testament, the first words spoken by God, recorded by God in the Old Testament in Genesis. And then the phrase, go ye therefore, go ye into all the world. The great commission passage. To carry the light of Christ into the world. In the School of Christian Studies, we often talk with our students about carrying the light. We'll use that phrase a lot, to carry the light of Christ into the world. This year, with the students across the university, we're using the phrase, fuel the flame. And if you see Wayland things on social media this year, you'll probably see the hashtag, fuel the flame, where we're talking with students about tending to their relationship with Christ in such a way that they are able to see the world as Christ sees the world and then serve with the eyes, the hands, the heart, the mind, the feet of Christ to serve all those who are in need. In the Gospel of John, one of the two texts that I want to use this morning, we find Jesus in John chapter 8, verse 12. And we can go to the next slide that I think has that passage. If you want to just look at the screen, you can do that. If you're old school and actually want to open up a Bible with pages, or if you want to follow along on your Bible app. Uh, I tend to be a bit old school. It's the history nerd in me. Um, John chapter 8. Now, a little bit of context for this passage before I read it, because we're going to read John chapter 8, and then we're going to go to the next passage that I want to use this morning in Matthew chapter 5. In this particular section of Jesus' life that John records, Jesus is in Jerusalem. This is fairly early in Jesus' ministry. He goes to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles. This year... Uh, our Jewish friends will celebrate the Feast of Tabernacle approximately September 20th to September 27th of this year. It, it kind of floats around on the calendar because the Jewish calendar is a lunar-based calendar, and so the, the dates will differ for celebrations from time to time. But Feast of Tabernacles will be coming up for our Jewish friends sep around September 20th. This is a powerful festival time in the life of a Jewish person, uh, in Jesus' day, it was a pilgrimage event where folks, if they were able, would make the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. All throughout the city for the Feast of Tabernacles, folks uh, would build little booths or shelters out of wood and reeds. 
and it was to commemorate the 40 years of wilderness wandering, the Exodus event. It was meant as a reminder of God's faithfulness and God's provision. Think back to the Old Testament storyline. Think back to the days in Sunday school when you would talk about Moses and the children of Israel. What guided Moses and the children of Israel through the desert? Fire. A column of smoke and a column of fire. That, and that very vivid symbolism of the presence of God. In Jesus' day, with the temple in Jerusalem, when the Feast of Tabernacles would come around, the priest kept going a massive set of candelabras in the temple court that would burn brightly, light, to symbolize that idea of God's presence that was so integral to the Exodus event. So picture in your mind Jesus in the temple grounds, the temple court area, the Feast of Tabernacles is now coming to an end when this occurs. And Jesus, who had already been talking about light in his early ministry, is going to make a very profound statement there in the midst of that celebration that's winding down where the light that God provided for light and guidance that God provided for the children of Israel, Jesus is going to make a very startling claim in John chapter 8, verse 12, where Jesus writes, and when John writes and Jesus speaks, when Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, quote, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. When Horatio Spafford stood at ship's edge, knowing what had transpired in that spot, how is it that he is able to muster the spiritual fortitude to pen those words, it is well? It is because Horatio Spafford not only knew but experienced the grace that comes with a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ that light of Christ that Jesus promises in this passage, I am the light of the world, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. As the darkness of that event tried to press in upon Spafford, he knew that he was truly well because of Christ's presence in and with him. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 5, the other passage that I want to utilize this morning. This is one of my favorite passages of Scripture. Um, you know, it, it's one that I, that I would fall back to as a high school student and college student. Um, and it's from the Sermon on the Mount, setting the scene once again. Jesus talking to his followers in what we popularly call the Sermon on the Mount. There on the hillsides that sweep up from the Sea of Galilee. Uh, some of you perhaps have had the privilege of traveling on a Holy Land tour. Uh, and if you have, you know, the Sea of Galilee is one of those stops that the tours go through, and oftentimes tour groups will go to an area that is about as best of a guess as we can have as to where that sermon might have taken place. When you go to the Sea of Galilee, it sits below sea level at the Sea of Galilee. There's sweeping hillsides that come up all around the sea. And so you can just look around this massive inland lake and just picture in your mind's eye where that sermon might have been. We know that Jesus' home base was Capernaum there on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee, not far from Capernaum. Uh, is you, if you were looking at Capernaum uh, from the south, you look just off uh, to the west a bit from Capernaum. There's this wonderful, very gradual sloping hillside going up, and that's why a number of folks think, well, maybe that was where Jesus delivered that sermon. You know, if we're really honest, we can't say exactly for sure where that sermon took place in that region, but we know we're fairly close uh, when you go on those tours. And what started out as Jesus teaching his closest followers, 
his disciples and others that tended to tag along turned into a pretty significant event with thousands of people gathering around because we know the story of the loaves and fishes that get connected with the Sermon on the Mount and various teachings. It would have been very easy for people to see there's a large crowd gathering on that hillside. I wonder what's going on. Let's go see. And so you get all these people there. But when you read these words in the Gospel of Matthew and when Luke records the event, remember that this is not just Jesus making some suggestions to the big crowd at large. This is Jesus teaching his followers the qualities that he expects from each of them. No matter what their occupation is, no matter what their gifts and talents are, as followers of him, these are the things that he expects them to do. And in Matthew chapter 5, starting with verse 14, 13, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. Quite a statement, especially given that Jesus in the temple area had said, I'm the light of the world. And now Jesus is telling his followers, you are the light of the world. Is Jesus telling his followers that they are little gods running around? No. We read on. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. The light that Jesus was talking about that his disciples were to carry was the light of Christ. And so what I'd like to do this morning is suggest a few things that come into play when we look at Jesus' claim of being the light of the world and the promise that those who follow him will never walk in darkness and then Jesus admonition to his followers to live into that light and be light in the world what does that mean for us as Christ followers well on the next slide I want to suggest four things very quickly and then a few things to remember so one we are called to an active presence as Christ followers we're called to an active purpose We're called to active participation in what God is at work doing, and we're called to an active perspective. What do I mean by those phrases? Well, that idea of active presence, we are called to be salt and light in the world. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. No maybes or when it's convenient or, oh gosh, I've got this event This night, I I can't be salt and light tonight. Maybe I can do it another time. Or, you know, God, I've got to have my business self Monday through Friday. I'll give you Saturday and Sunday to be light. This is a a 24-hour-a-day, seven-days-a-week, 365-day commitment that Christ expects from all of Christ's followers. It's a part of the reason why at Wayland Baptist University, when we talk with students about What do you want to be when you grow up? We want to prepare them well to be the best doctor, lawyer, teacher, whatever it is that fills in the occupational blank that then is also demonstrating the light of Christ where God places them to serve. If we're not doing that as a Baptist Christian university, then we need to take Baptist out of our middle name And we might as well shut the doors because there are a whole host of other universities that can do the academic side of things that we do so well. Because our heartbeat as a Baptist Christian university is not only to prepare our students academically to be the best they can be in whatever occupation God calls them to, but to be the light of Christ where God places them. And it is the same thing for each of us. As Christ's followers, Christ compels us to be the light of Christ where God places us. 
active presence. Active purpose. We have one purpose, and that's to make Christ known. With all due respect to uh, a good friend out in California who wrote a book about purpose-driven life and churches, to me, that's a pretty simple question to answer. Purpose? To make Christ known. Now, the specifics of that can be a little trickier at times. You know, what are the gifts and talents that God has placed in me? What might be God calling me to do occupationally? Where might God want me to live? Where, you know, all those other things be figured out, but the central purpose, make Christ known. To, and we do that as Christ followers, and that, that does give us a great, should give us a great deal of confidence as we make Christ known, because one, Jesus promised us that those who follow him would have the light of Christ and they will not walk in darkness. And so we, as we serve in some of the most difficult circumstances imaginable, as life presses upon us some of the most difficult trials that we could imagine, we have that promise that Christ is with us and we will not walk in darkness. We are able to do the things that God calls us to do because of the presence of Christ in our life. That idea of active purpose. To make Christ known and to shine the light of Christ. Active participation. We are called to be involved, and I'm not going to belabor that point. You know, it, is, it is a part of who we are. It should be at the very core of our being. We are called to reflect Christ and not the world. What Jesus suggests here is very countercultural. To embody qualities like was prayed during the offertory prayer this morning. To love others. To serve others. To say a good word rather than a harsh word. To treat others as we would want to be treated ourselves. It's countercultural. It's not easy at times. The press of the world around us can create fear or create timidity in living out that idea of active participation. And yet when we realize, one, that we have the living Christ in relationship with him, that promise from him that we have that light and we do not walk in darkness, the presence of Christ with us, why should we fear anything? And then when we realize that as Christ followers, corporately, with each of us walking in relationship with Christ, the strength, the power, the witness that carries, something as simple as 30 individuals who are Christ followers all coming together to help someone in a time of need to move, shines that light of Christ. When Christ's followers come together to identify a need in a community, a need in a county, a need in a state, a need in a nation, or a need in the world, and they band together to shine the light of Christ, to demonstrate the love of Christ tangibly, it's a powerful thing. As a church historian, I could, I could spend all afternoon, and I know y'all typically get done at noon, and I want to make sure y'all beat the Methodists to the restaurant, you know, I could spend hours talking about examples of when Christianity was in its darkest moments, if you will. The light of Christ shone so brightly through Christ's followers in those dark moments that Christianity experienced its greatest growth rather than fears of demise. How often when we pray for God to heal our nation or heal our world, do we include in that prayer a request for God to make known how we can be an active part in doing that? It's easy to pray for God to do it. It's a bit more difficult for us to include ourselves and ask God, what gifts what talents, what locations have you placed me in so that I can be a part of that healing and transformation that is so desperately needed as I live into 
your calling, your presence, your light shining through me. Active participation. And then active perspective. What I would suggest that with the light that comes in the relationship with Jesus Christ, Christ changes our perspective on the world. We see things in a new way. We see people in a different way. We see opportunities for service that we might not otherwise see. And when we see those things and experience those things, the presence, the purpose, the participation challenges that perspective for us to act and to act as Christ would act. So how do we do this? Well, I'd, I'd suggest a few things to remember that are going to come through as we roll through these last few slides. One, remember it is not our light that we're sharing. Now, one of the things that I do as a hobby, um, I'm a photographer as a hobbyist. And so all the pictures that you're seeing today are pictures that I've taken. And I, I love this picture. It's from the, one of the earliest territorial capitals in Montana, a town called Bannock. Uh, this particular building happened to serve as both the Masonic Lodge and the schoolhouse in that town. And it was a, if you go into the history of Bannock, Montana, it was literally a wild, wild west town. Fairly lawless at times and all. This particular structure, the lodge was on the second floor, schoolhouse on the first floor. Why show this picture? That entire picture is lit by the light of a full moon. Last night we had a full moon. Uh, I don't know if any of y'all noticed how bright it was. Uh, y'all know from science, does the moon have any light in and of itself? No. The only light that the moon sheds on us is light that is reflected from the sun. And that light that the moon reflects upon us is dependent upon the moon's availability its position and all and that and how the moon moves through its phases limits how much sun is reflected back onto the earth when christ calls us to be light the light that we are sharing is not generated by ourselves we have no light to per se to generate ourselves the light that we reflect as christ followers is the light of jesus christ now, sometimes we try to replace that light. Sometimes we try to co-opt the language of following Christ to maneuver and get into play our own desires. But remember, the light is not ours, it's Christ. That should also determine how we share that light, because too often, you know, when Jesus and Matthew talks about being salt of the earth and light of the world too many of us would rather be salty to the earth and lightning to the earth instead of being salt and being light it's not our light second thing on the next slide that comes we share a common calling i've made this point already all of us as christ followers share that common calling as a church historian i know all too well that there are many times throughout history and today is no different than days past where sometimes some of our most bitter enemies and most horrible words we share are toward other christ followers not to mention what we might say about those who are not christ followers we need to remember that as Christ followers, we share a common calling. We may not always agree with one another on some things, but we all share a calling to make Christ known. And when we do that well, the world sees it and the world is drawn to it. This particular picture was taken in Zurich, Switzerland back in 2018 when we could travel before COVID and all that. And this was a gathering of the Baptist World Alliance. One of the privileges I've had in my ministry is to work with the Baptist World Alliance, a gathering of Baptist conventions from around the world that get together to figure out how best we can share Christ and join together in partnership 
across international lines. This particular church is what's known as the Grossmünster in Zurich, Switzerland. It is, you know, if you go to Old Zurich, it is the most prominent feature in the town. In the Reformation era, this church was pastored by a guy by the name of Ulrich Zwingli. And in the midst of the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s, there's a lot of conflict within Christianity over who understood Christianity best. Conflict to the point that Christians decided to kill other Christians. At this particular church, Ulrich Zwingli had a group of followers decided that they felt like people should be baptized as adults rather than children. And there was a church split. What did Zwingli and the rest of the Swiss Reformed Church do? They hunted those individuals down, drowned them in rivers, put them in jails. You know, in the Reformation era, we're oftentimes quick to remember that Roman Catholics during that era prosecuted or persecuted Protestants. We tend to conveniently forget the part that Protestants persecuted other Protestants as well as Catholics. We share a common calling to make Christ known. There should be power and strength in that, especially when fear kind of creeps in and we think, I can't do this. We need to remember that, one, we have the presence of Christ, and two, we have the power of the body of Christ as well. Third reminder, step boldly into the darkness. Wherever God places you, whatever circumstance you find yourself in, step boldly into it. Whether it's going to a major city or a small town, step boldly into the darkness. And if you're trying to figure out where that is, that's my, that's my home area. That's Chicago, Illinois. Uh, L train running through the area. I like the picture of the L train moving. It kind of symbolizes heading into wherever God wants us to lead, lead and serve. Fourth, beware the bowl or the bushel basket. Remember in Matthew it says that light is to give light to the world. Don't put it on, you don't put it under a bushel or a bowl to hide it. Beware of the things that dim or diminish the light of Christ. When we, don't, when we fail to tend to following the commands of Christ, when we put our priorities over the priorities of Christ, we diminish that light. Uh, as a church historian, I'm captivated by church structures, and one of the things I've become a bit obsessed about with photography is abandoned churches. This is an old abandoned church in north-central Texas in the town of German. If you travel from Lubbock to Fort Worth on 114, you pass through this little town of German. Just to the south of 114 is the old Methodist church there. Now, the town transitioned, railroad passed it by, population went away, and now this church sits in ruin. Uh, old piano sitting by the window creates a vivid story. But it can happen to us as individuals, it can happen to us as congregations when we don't tend to the light well. We can fall prey to the bowl or the bushel and it impacts our ability to serve. And then finally, as we have the last slide come up, focus on the goal to make Christ known so that all whom we come in contact with can come to know the crucified and resurrected Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this morning that you've given us, for this chance to come together and worship, to sing songs of praise, to share prayer concerns, to band together as a body of Christ, to, to figure out how best to serve the communities where we live. Lord, we pray that you would move in a powerful way in our midst, in the midst of our cities, in the midst of our state, in the midst of our nation, in the midst of our world, and that you would help us understand how we can play an active role in shining the light of Christ and join you in the work that you are doing of redemption. 
Lord, we pray this morning for those who need to make decisions that, they, that you will prompt them and pull them forward. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. The invitation this morning is an invitation to carry the light. It may be that you realize this morning that you've not experienced the light of Christ in your life and you need to accept Christ as your Savior. That's available this morning to come down front and Jacob's going to be down front to receive those who need to. It may be that this morning's invitation is a time for you to pray and ask God, how can I fuel the flame and be the light where you have placed me, God? Or it may be that you have a sense of calling to ministry. You know, when I was growing up, when I was a wee lad, uh, back in the ancient days of the 1960s and 70s, it was not uncommon for pastors to include in the invitation a calling out of the called, so to speak. I'm, I'm not terribly fond of that language, I'll admit, because it implies that only ministers have a calling. And I would suggest that Scripture suggests to us that we all have a calling to make Christ known and that some are gifted and called to serving in ministry circles. But it may be that you feel called to ministry and you need to talk with someone about that this morning. The invitation is open. Michelle's going to lead us and Jacob's going to receive down front. So now's the time to come. Let's stand.